while I set up my computer, I'll just add a couple little points on some of those questions that Ryan asked. Um, one, the on-label use is L1 through L5. Doug is absolutely right. A percentage of the population has an S1 spinous process. But even if they do, the sacral ala, the sacral lamina can sometimes um, cause your cam lobes to slide. So in my opinion, I think you need a fixation device at L5-S1 if you're truly going to go there. So even though you could technically place a superion in L5-S1, I don't think that's the right thing for the patient because of the angle uh, of the sacral lamina at L5-S1. So All right. Can I ask you one quick question? Sure. You're the expert on this. I know I'm taking up some time. So um, is there a way that, in your mind, you make the determination that I'll choose, you know, a fixation device that's like a perm fixation, like a zip or a Minuteman versus a Vertiflex? Like, how are you making that determination? Yeah, so, so for me, the key thing here is stability versus instability, okay? So do, as I've already mentioned, with the non-fixating superior but Vertiflex procedure, if there's any instability, you should not do it. If the spine is stable and you need indirect decompression, go for it. If there is instability, you identify that as three millimeter translation, you know, even less at higher levels of the lumbar spine based on the work of Pajabi and White. If you see fluid in the facets, all of these things are signals that there's instability, even micro instability of the spine. That's where you consider providing stability or a fusion. You know, and, and as we go deeper into this, you know, do we need 0% movement or do we need stabilization? where there's a reduction in movement, but that's good enough for the human body so that we reduce adjacent level disease. So I think these are the debates we're having in this, in this world. Uh, but an unstable spine needs help if that's what's causing the generation of pain. If it's no genoclaudication or ridiculous symptoms, then you need to do something about it. And that's where we have our great colleagues in spine surgery to help us, or we'll debate, you know, interspinous fixation, is that the right way to go? We just need more data on that. Great question. All right, so the most fun talk of the entire day, reimbursement. Um, so we, we've broken this down in the past uh, into posterior elements, um, intraspinal and anterior elements. Uh, I think this is the only reimbursement talk. So we'll kind of just see how things uh, play out. Um, so this is really an open discussion and it, I'm, I'm really looking forward to having John, Doug, Neil, uh, and even Tyler, uh, who's a year out, kind of weigh in on, on some of these issues. One of the things, if you're in your first few years of training, one of the things you know I realized when I was in your stage is that the beans you get for the things you do are not given. They were developed and reiterated upon by those who came before you. And that's all based on a huge political process with the American Medical Association, CMS, the commercial payers. So if you don't understand this stuff, it's really time to do so, even if you're in an RVU-based model where you just think, I go to the hospital, I do this procedure, I get this amount of money. Because guess what? We're all taxpayers, right? And our money matters, and we're seeing the percent GDP for healthcare dollars going to CMS, and CMS, as you're seeing, is trying to claw back. So there's going to be a big battle for the next several decades on how this all plays out. So it is important, even if you don't think you have to care about this, to care about this. So... If for the international crowd, you're probably going to roll your eyes at all the stuff we're going to go into, but nonetheless, uh, let's do it. So I am by no means a coding, billing, or reimbursement expert. Um, I didn't know any of this stuff when I was a couple years out, when I was Tyler's stage. I didn't know anything. I was at UCSF thinking, I just do it, I get the money. Uh, and then I realized, especially when I jumped into private practice, how the sausage is made. Uh, and I want to go through the process and challenges of obtaining authorization and reimbursement. So uh, Tyler started off today talking about the facet joints. So the CPT codes, current procedural terminology codes for facet joint medial branch blocks or intraarticular injections is as follows for the cervical and thoracic spine, 64490 through 92. So one level, two level, three level. Um, what many of us are finding is that uh, payers are only paying up to two levels depending on where you practice. Okay, so what I will say about where I practice in the San Francisco Bay Area may be very different for Doug in, in Oklahoma, very different for John in Eastern Washington. Um, so that's why we're here, to have this conversation. Uh, and for the lumbosacral facet joints, 64493 through 95. The ICD-10 codes, again, depends on your LCD, on your NCD, et cetera. But in general, I use uh, lumbar spondylosis without myelopathy, uh, depending on which region I'm in. 
Um, as you guys probably already know, the diagnostic criteria for medial branch blocks is always changing depending on the payer with time. It used to be 50%, then it went 70%, then it's 80%. I'm pretty sure there'll be a day they ask for 110% relief with their medial branch blocks. Um, <laughs> so you can see how they're tightening the screws on this. They're also demanding functional outcomes. So if you're not already getting an ODI or some other functional outcome, do so. Um, I, I bake in all this stuff into my intake forms. So when patients come in, if they've had any procedure, whether it's an epidural steroid injection, an RFA, a spinal cord stimulator, or whatever else, just bake in these, these functional outcomes because all the payers are gonna ask for this. And while that's cumbersome, it is the right thing to do. It's not about pain scores anymore. Um, there's too much secondary gain in that. A lot of issues with pain scores. Functional outcomes are really important. So start doing that if you're not already doing it. For radiofrequency ablation, these are the 646 uh, codes. So uh, 3, 3, and 3, 4 for the cervical and thoracic, 3, 5, and 3, 6 for lumbosacral. Again, same ICD-10. In general, for the medial branch blocks, you have to have two different medial branch blocks. Uh, used to be differential blockade with different local anesthetics. That's no longer really the issue. Uh, you can use the same. They just wanted two separate days, uh, seeing at least, depending on your payer, 70, 75, 80% relief functional improvement, reduction in meds, whatever else for several hours. And then you qualify for a medial branch rate of frequency ablation at those specific levels. Uh, and in general, as I mentioned, they are paying for up to two levels. Uh, additional levels you can ask for with a letter of medical necessity, but uh, you can always come back to those other levels in the future if you want as well. The new thing for this year is that pre-authorization in the hospital setting is now required. So for those of you who do work in a hospital-based setting, um, Sorry, um, that's gonna be a little bit more cumbersome. Uh, again, you know, I think that CMS is looking for ways to cut costs and they look at the highest volume procedures and they think about, well, what are the ways we can uh, maybe improve outcomes and reduce the costs associated with unnecessary procedures? Uh, we've seen now that, that difference with epidural steroid injections, all the criteria have now become more stringent. Again, you have to be documenting Functional outcomes, if you're not already doing that, you could be clawed back for, from CMS for all of your epidurals. I saw a friend on Thursday night. He was playing guitar. We were hanging out. And he told me, man, I'm going through this Medicare audit for epidural surgery injections. I mean, I mean, I do so many of them. And I'm, I'm like, yeah, you got to read, read the documents that CMS provides. It's all online. You can read your LCD, read your NCD, and just literally make that your template in your notes. If you're not doing that, years later, Medicare come back and say, hey, you gave too much dexamethasone. You did three levels, not two levels, and therefore claw back. So definitely pay attention to all of that if you're not doing so. Any questions on the facet joint interventions? I did not go into neurostim on that, but that just gives you the intraarticular and RFA. All right, sacroiliac joints, fun times. And we have Dr. Beal here who's been very involved in helping us uh, navigate the chaos associated with this area of the body. So the, the calm and cool code of 27096, which hardly pays anything, is still that and no issues there. Uh, these are the codes M53.3, sacrococcygeal disorder, or M46.1, which is sacroiliitis. For those of you um, who are interested in doing a lateral branch RFA, you can do lateral branch diagnostic blocks S1 through S3. There is a code for that that came out in 2020, 64451. That's where you walk down the lateral aspects of the sacral 1, 2, and 3 foramina inject a little, little local anesthetic like you would for the medial branch blocks, and again, document outcomes. That would, in general, allow you to do sacral, sacroiliac joint lateral branch radiofrequency ablation. However, uh, CMS in November of last year dropped the bomb and basically opened public comment in order to revoke uh, the ability to get coverage or reimbursement for sacroiliac joint RFA, and in March, they confirmed that. So I have many patients who have actually done really well with this particular therapy. They come back every six or 12 months um, and they can't have it anymore. These are Medicare patients. And their, their option really is only steroid injections or fusion. And while we have growing data and the SI joint fusion area, a lot of these patients are totally freaked out by triangular rods being put in, especially our 90 year old patients. Um, and while we're developing more data for the posterior allograft approach, um, the idea of a fusion when you're, you know, for some of these patients is not great. So, so in my opinion, this is a huge loss of options for our patients. Um, so I'd advise all of you to help us, whether from a society level or as an individual, allow us to, to get this back on. 
It's not only advocacy, there is data regarding sacred lake joint RF bay, Nailish Patel, Leo Caparel, Steve Cohen, they've done their studies, uh, two retrospectives. Dr. Patel's was prospective um, placebo controlled. The sample size wasn't large enough. So we really need better data. There is data, it's just we need better data. Um, and of course, we need to be tracking our outcomes, proving that this is actually an effective therapy for the patients who really don't have other options. And I'm a huge proponent of fusion in the right situation, but there are a number of patients who really aren't candidates or don't want it. So again, what are we stuck with? Injections, steroids, that's not good for a 90-year-old lady. That's gonna you know, potentially cause other issues related to those steroids. So again, to me, this is kind of the biggest issue I've dealt with in the last year that I'm kind of irritated about, if you can't tell. Um, and now we'll move on. So posterior sacral leg joint arthrodesis, Dr. Beal uh, has done wonderful work in, and again, what we fight for, and we're on the same wavelength in this, is allowing our patients to have options, allowing us to have options to figure out what is right. So never mind the, the, the speak of certain companies or whatever else where they think they're the best thing and everybody else is terrible. We're the ones who are doing this and we're the ones who live with the patients for the rest of their lives and our lives. So we have to understand, have good consciousness about what we're doing. Having the ability to do a posterior approach, a posterior lateral approach, a lateral approach. We talked about it last night. We're still figuring this out. So what changed for 2023 was that the posterior sacral leg joint arthrodesis with allograft is now a T code, so CAT3 but come 2024, we'll be a CAT1 code, and we're still figuring out, Doug, I don't know if you wanna chime in here, what that reimbursement's gonna look like. So the uh, 0775T will convert to a category one code that will pay about, um, unfortunately, 50% of the 27279, which is a conventional minimally invasive SI joint fusion. And I say unfortunately, because that was devalued too much, in my opinion. Uh, and this is a very good approach as, Ramo mentioned this is associated with um, uh, data from the SECURE trial, perspective single, multi-site, single arm trial. But the data was uh, analogous to Insight, Sci-Fi, and IMEA, the, the three, two level ones and one uh, of the similar type of trial uh, produced by SI Bone. So this is um, one of the things, that, but the, uh, uh, one of the positive things that have come out of the of the coding and reimbursement thing, one of the positive pieces of flotsam and jetsam is that the category uh, one code will be applied twice with a 51 modifier for a hybrid approach. So if you fuse posteriorly, fuse lateral or posterior lateral, you'll get the additive of both category one codes. So that, and that's probably only because of the posterior code was devalued so much uh, that the additive of the both category ones will do will, will be okay for a hybrid approach. So 27279 won't change, 27280 for the open fusion, the, the, the uh, maximally invasive fusion, uh, and then devalued the new category one for posterior approach and uh, um, the additive for the hybrid. That covers SI joint fusion all the way around. Great input. Um, and I just want to give a huge thanks to Doug for, he's doing a lot of work behind the scenes, getting on these meetings, getting these calls, just explaining a lot of this. And again, I can't thank you enough, Doug, for giving us all these options and all the work you do. It's not, it's not fun. It's not really paid well <laughs> at all. <laughs> so uh, thank you for uh, your advocacy. Yes, John, please. Just one other comment uh, with respect to sacral iliac joint. Um, Noridian, which is the Northwest and West Administrator for Medicare, actually the entire sacral iliac joint injection has a new LCD, which everybody should be familiar with, which is quite restrictive just for injections as well. So I think that's important to, everybody's familiar with that. Yeah, great point. Um, I did not mention that because I've always been kind of practicing under those <laughs> guidelines, but some of the, the things to add in are, um, it's kind of, the, the wordage is not very great, but um, basically maximum two milliliters of injectate um, with or without steroid, local anesthetic has to be used. They kind of are confusing in that the first block is supposed to be diagnostic, but maybe with steroid. Um, contrast must be used to identify an orthogram. Um, and then again, some of the other functional outcomes. I think those are the major things. Yeah, provocative. You have to have three out of five For sure. provocative tests positive, which a lot of people are doing anyway, but not everybody. Yeah. It's, it's not always 
consistent. The, the other Macs are different. Uh, I, I view Nerinian as the uh, Nerinian is the Mac of Nietzsche. They're the treatment nihilists of the Medicare administrative contractors. West Coast, baby. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Any questions before I get into interspinous devices? Okay. So I left some blanks on purpose. So what I just demonstrated, indirect lumbar decompression, non-fixation, 22869 and 70, the ICD-10, there's only one. That is lumbar spinal stenosis with neurogenic claudication, M48.062. 061 is without neurogenic claudication, okay? Um, CMS does cover commercial payers, that's a whole other uh, kit and caboodle. Inner laminar inner spinal stabilization. Um, they're not sponsoring. The company is Surgiline. They have the CoFlex device done by surgeons with decompression. Those are the CPT codes, 22867 and, and the second level, 22868. Um, a number of ICD-10 codes with or without neurogenic claudication and then um, of the spinal canal and then 99 codes. And then inner spinous fusion. I did not put the CPT codes because I'm sure that was going to lead us some to debate. So, Doug, Neil. Um, 22612, 22840. And, uh, and Neil, are you happy with that? Okay. So there's a lot of discussion debate with uh, the use of that code based on the vignette regarding uh, in, a, in adjunct to anterior fusion or facet fusion. Um, so we'll leave it at that as an open discussion. John, do you have anything else to add regarding interspinous fusion? Um, I just utilize the 22612 code. I don't uh, add anything else onto that. Right on. All right. So this audience is pretty good about that. No, no open discussion any further. So I will jump into the anterior spinal elements, which I know it wasn't listed, but we're going to get into some of these procedures here um, with discography. Um, annual plasty, nucleoplasty, and, and Doug and I do a lot of this. I'm sure John does as well. Uh, I think Doug's going to do a demonstration on interdiscal uh, nucleus pulposus allograft supplementation, currently a T-code uh, with that ICD-10. I'm going to do a demonstration on basi vertebral nerve radiofrequency ablation, uh, just obtained a CPT code in 2022 uh, with the ICD-10 October 2021. CMS covers, commercial pairs are starting to cover across the country. Uh, and then kyphoplasty, sacroplasty, uh, which Doug is going to demonstrate, I am certain. All right, so I'll open it up for any Q&A. You guys have any questions about these different codes for these different procedures? Totally clear? Crystal. Perfect. All right, great. So I think it's time to... Turn it over to Dr. Nelson. And as usual here at IGIS, we are right on.